Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. This book exposes all the essential information to understand the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. What is this New World Order, and who is bringing about, who is bringing it about, and who is at the top of the top of this New World Order? This book will help us dispel the myths and the rumors and the disinformation, and uh, that's why I considered it important enough to read on this broadcast. I hope you appreciate the information that P.D. Stewart brings forward, and I hope you'll get a copy of this book, rather that you'll get at least two copies of this book, one to read and study and keep for yourself and do your own research, and one to share with someone who will make use of it. Now, at the end of the broadcast on last Friday, we were talking about the initial um, formation of this society known as the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order. It says, in June 1541, Pope Paul III gave Loyola and his company the parish and church of Santa Maria della Strada, that is, Our Lady of the Road, a church dedicated to Mary, the Black Madonna. Now, Mary is the patron saint of the Jesuit order, all right? So they have a special veneration to this demonic apparition known as Mary. Now, this might be somewhat disconcerting to some of my listeners who believe in the immortality of the soul and the transmigration of the soul, that Mary is not ascended into heaven. She is lying peacefully in her grave awaiting the first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous. Mary's not speaking to anyone. And uh, she served her human purpose to bring, uh, to be the, the mother or to bring Christ to give birth to our Messiah. She was a servant of the Lord, and she awaits her reward. But she's not speaking to anyone. What is known in the world today as the apparition of Mary can only be a demonic apparition. And uh, and this order, the Jesuit order, is dedicated to this demonic apparition. And it was under her patronage, this so-called Black Madonna, it was under her patronage that Loyola's company was consecrated. Loyola credited, credited his conversion to his vision of the Madonna. So the Madonna was... The Madonna was uh, appearing even at this time and before. But this, this demonic apparition is what inspired Ignatius Loyola in his formation of this diabolical Jesuit order. And Loyola, the author writes, even dubbed himself a knight of the Holy Virgin. So he arrogated to himself... A knighthood in her name. Now, Pope Paul's bull of 1540 had initially limited the number of members of the uh, Loyola Society to just 60, 60 members initially. However, this limitation was later removed through another bull, another papal bull entitled Injunctum Nobis, on March 14, 1543, thus began what can be called, in a manner of speaking, the age of Loyola and the doctrines of devils, unquote. The Pope had liberated these anarchists, setting them loose like Samson's foxes with firebrands between their tails, like the withering blast from blights all, uh, the withering blast that blights all it touches. Or as William Crayshaw wrote satirically, quote, the Jesuits made their entrance flying like locusts out of the bottomless pit to repair the ruins of the Roman Catholic Church and to, fo- and to fill her golden cup 
with a new supply of spiritual fornications. Now, why did the Roman Catholic Church need to be rescued? Because of the Protestant Reformation. That once the Protestants got the, a copy of the Bible in their own language so they could read it for themselves, they knew what the Roman Catholic Church was. The, the synagogue of Satan. And that it was a human contravation. It was not the Church of Christ, but the Church of Antichrist. And they came out. Left Rome tottering on her heels. Doom was in Rome's face, and it was the Jesuit order that restored Rome's power in the world. And we're seeing the culmination of that restoration today. It's called the New World Order. Now, these equivocating and designing Jesuits are like Balaam, who taught Balak to cast stumbling blocks before the children of Israel. Like those of whom Paul says they, quote, creep into houses, leaving captive silly men and women, teaching the doctrines of men, and bringing in damnable heresies into the church. Ignatius Loyola's order was a resurrection of its prototype, the Occult Knights Templar Order. Now here the author admits that this is an occultic order along the same lines as the Knights Templar. In other words, they are, in a, in a sense, a resurrection of the Knights Templar. And this was pointed out to us in uh, F. Tupper Saucy's book, Rulers of Evil. He holds the same opinion of the Jesuit order, that the Knights Templar were not destroyed, but that they were simply resurrected on in another name. It says, except that the Jesuits were also given full ecclesiastical life. In other words, they were priests uh, as well as warriors. And it says, when the bull of Pope Paul III was executed in the palace of St. Marco, the name of Loyola's new order was changed from the Company of Jesus to the Society of Jesus, Societas Jesu, or S.J. and S.I., in other words, when a Jesuit wants to expose himself, he, when he signs his name, he will write S.J. after his name, or S.I., standing for the Society of Jesus or the Society of, uh, of uh, Jesus. Okay, they're also known as the Jesuits. Now, the Jesuits have many names. Uh, I... Won't bother try to name them all, but this book will name many of them. One of them is the company. That's just a, a, a uh, an innocuous term that is used in reference to the Jesuits that one might not readily understand if he hears it. Anyway, how preposterous that a society that says, quote, it is lawful to make use of the science acquired through the assistance of the devil, unquote, can call itself the Society of Jesus. Such is the audacity of the Jesuits. Now, if you're just now tuning into the broadcast and you didn't hear the previous broadcast, we showed in a previous chapter that the Jesuits admit the lawful use of science, information acquired through the assistance of the devil. And uh, what's most memorable about that chapter is that the San Francisco, uh, the, the University of San Francisco.
it says further, Jesus himself described that rule of life which the society follows. Where on earth does Jesus describe the rule of life that the society of Jesus follows? Where in the Bible did Christ ever describe an order such as the Jesuit order and the means by which they will, they have subdued the world to the, to the, to the, uh, the papacy's control? The author continues, but writes Blavatsky, he's talking about Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the occultist, genius and, and author, wrote many occultic books. Quote, let all pious Christians listen and acquaint themselves with this alleged rule of life as exemplified by the Jesuits. Peter Alagona in the Saint, in Saint Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica Compendium says, quote, by the command of God, now listen to this, by the command of God it is lawful to kill an innocent person to steal or commit fornication because he, that is Jesus, is the Lord of life and death and of all things, and it is due to him thus to fulfill his command, unquote. What a name they give to Jesus. They make him the minister of unrighteousness. The Jesuit order makes Christ the minister of unrighteousness. He says, to what depths will these Jesuits not sink? Reader, the only correlation between the society of Jesus and the, and the Jesus of Nazareth is that both names begin with the letter J. But then heaven and hell also start with the same letter. And as everyone knows, these are two vastly different places. Well said, P.D. Stewart. Now under the title, A New Secular Breed of Priests, the author writes, Loyola's masterly and visionary plan was the creation of a cadre of highly trained and dedicated men who, unlike the ordinary Catholic clergy, would be able to dispute with their adversaries on the basis of equal subtlety and equal psychological sophistication. His ingenious idea was a new secular breed of priests, a secretive order of hand-picked and specially trained men to be set out to work in all trades, vocations, and professions. They would serve in any capacity required as plumbers, carpenters, lawyers, doctors, teachers, economists, bankers, politicians, advisors of states, and as priests. Wherever they were sent, they would go. Whatever is required of them, they would do. Now, this is what needs to be remembered. A Jesuit can take on any disguise. He can fit in any crowd and rise to a position of leadership. They are chameleons, blending in with the environment, and working their poisonous design everywhere they go. And what is that? The extirpation of Protestantism and all that Protestantism teaches and subduing the world to the Pope's sovereign authority. That's a new world order under the Pope. That is their stated purpose. And why the American people are so ignorant of this is amazing. Because this information is too, too, too readily available. It's just not talked about. It's considered politically incorrect. And it's time that we brush all that aside. And we learn about this Jesuit order. And thanks to P.D. Stewart, we have this book. It says, These Jesuit priests were not all required to dress in the traditional garb of the Roman Catholic priesthood. In fact, 
they were given license to dress as they liked, an important part of their disguise. As American historian J. Wayne Lawrence writes, quote, They are not merely priests or of one religious creed. They are merchants and editors and men of any profession, having no outward badge by which to be recognized. So they're hard to pick out of a crowd. And they have no religious creed. In other words, they can feign any religion they want if their efforts to infiltrate a particular religion is, is, is possible to bring it either into blind submission to the papacy over, or to overthrow it, to plan its overthrow. And that's their, that's been their modus operandi in the Protestant churches. All the different non-Catholic, quote unquote, Christian sects in this, in this country have been infiltrated by the Jesuits. Now, in this little company of priests, confederated for a glorious enterprise, their quote unquote grand design, which is world domination under the headship of the Pope, Every needful power and gift is present. Though relatively small in number, this little host is great in talent, in stern resolve, and constant in purpose, boasting men of ancient lineage, noble birth, and great wealth, of accomplished scholarship, genius, and of popular eloquence. They have thousands of brethren who belong to this class known as the unknown, If they do choose to identify themselves, they use the initials S.J. after their names. Now, he's going to talk about the success of the Protestant Reformation past and its overturn. Archibald writes, quote, This order alone has contributed more than all the other Catholic orders together to confirm the wavering nations in the faith of Rome, Roman Catholicism to support the tottering authority of the high pontiff, that is the Pope, to check and reverse, to check the the progress of the Protestant Reformation, and to make amends for the losses their holiness, the Pope, had sustained in Europe by propagating the gospel, and with it a blind submission to the Holy See. Unquote. Martin Chemnitz, in his examination of the Council of Trent in 1565, confirms, quote, This sect, which was only established by the Roman pontiff for the specific purpose of destroying the churches that embraced the pure teachings of the gospel, unquote. And another author, Ellen White, comments, quote, The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from every earthly tie and human interest, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason, and conscience, wholly silenced, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult to assume. It was a fundamental principle of the Jesuit order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable when they served the interests of the Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. They even became servants to to act as spies upon the masters. They established colleges for the sons of Protestant princes and nobles and schools for the common people. Unquote. But the overturning of the Protestant Reformation was by no means the only aim of the order. Their ultimate goal or plan, says Kaufman, 
was to secure for the Pope of Rome absolute sovereignty and supremacy over all the governments of the earth, unquote. That is the plan. And I will add, that is the New World Order. That's And it says their mission is to either neutralize or extinguish Protestantism and its democratic principles, thereby restoring papal supremacy and thus leaving Jesuitism in possession of the field. And what is the field? The world. And it's white unto harvest. And the tares have grown up among the wheat. And it's time for us to be able to distinguish the tares from the wheat. And among those tares, the most dangerous of them are the Jesuit order and the Roman Catholic Church. And it's time for us to know the difference between God's people and those who profess his name and then work Satan's business. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? 
Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And with your contribution, get access to the audio archives, and you can listen to all Liberty Radio Live programming at your leisure. Now, the author continues. He says, Archbishop de Pratt tells us, when Ignatius Loyola offered his plan to destroy the work of Luther's Protestant Reformation, he addressed the Vatican thus, quote, Your ancient props no longer suffice. I offer you new support. You must have a fresh army, which will cover you with the arms of heaven and earth. Adopt my well-instructed auxiliaries. Light makes war upon you. We Jesuits will carry intelligence to some, darken knowledge in others, and direct it in all. The human mind is awakened. It is ener- If its energy is not extinguished, all eyes will be opened. In other words, the light of the gospel had come to the world through the Protestant Reformation. Light, the gospel, made war upon the papacy. And that the Jesuits would darken that light and direct the world toward the restoration of darkness. This is a tacit admission. He says the human mind is awakened. And not only was the human mind awakened, the human spirit was awakened. The God-given breath of life was awakened to the truth of the gospel through the Protestant Reformation. It would have destroyed the darkness if it were allowed to succeed and prosper. And it was up to the Jesuits to extinguish that light and to, to... to prop the, the the papacy back up to its midnight throne. Darkness is about to envelop the world because the Jesuits have won this battle. And the ecumenical movement has snuffed out the candle of Protestantism, snuffed out the light of the gospel, the false doctrines, and a lackadaisical attitude toward our faith, and a destruction of of God's holy word with with diabolical translations that gut the power of God's word, a destruction of God's law, which makes us all ministers of unrighteousness. That was the Jesuits' purpose, to stop the Protestant Reformation and restore tyranny to the world. Now, the author continues, On August 6, 1623, Urban VIII confirmed this plan when he said, As the Almighty God raised up other holy men in other times, so he has raised up a St. Ignatius Loyola in the society established by him, to oppose Luther and the heretics of his day. 
the religious sons of this society follow the luminous way of so great a parent, continue to give an unfailing example in the successful conduct of the most important affairs of the Catholic Church, and they have conducted this most important affair with outlandish cunning, much savoir faire, and to devastating effect, like a fire that rages upon a plain, continually extending itself and gathering strength as it spreads, like a deadly virus carried upon the wind, like the dark horsemen of the apocalypse, the enemies of mankind, unquote. Yes, I say the enemies of mankind. Read here what the famous Jesuit Amicus says, Quote, a priest may kill those who hinder him from taking ecclesiastical office, unquote. And the Jesuit Escobar tells us, quote, servants may secretly steal from their masters as much as they judge their labor is worth, more than the wages which they receive, unquote. Read next the message of salvation from Loyola's companion Francis Xavier, quote, it is not mortal sin for parents to wish the death of their children, nor to desire the death of anyone who troubles the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. Or what about Escobar, who says in his Theologia Moralis, quote, It is lawful to kill an accuser whose testimony may jeopardize your life and honor, unquote. Reader, I defy the impudence of the devil himself to utter more diabolical doctrines than these Jesuit fathers. As Thomas Carlyle wrote scornfully, quote, Ignatius's Amazing that America is is as a as a as a whole completely ignorant of what this Jesuit order is. They don't know anything about it. And I can tell you from my experience talking about these things on amateur radio, they don't want to hear about it. The word Jesuit doesn't mean anything to them. And to tell the truth about it is well, the reaction indicates that they think it is the most grand and ridiculous conspiracy theory going. But I want to tell you, as one author wrote, there have been 6,000 books written about the Jesuit order. Where are they? Well, I'm collecting some in my library. I'm over 300 now. I'd have to count maybe closer to 400 books now in my library. I bought six books this week. And um, it is a, it is an absolute, well, it's incomprehensible that Christians, that God's people in this country know nothing of their greatest enemy. It's it's a hard enough sell, in my experience, to convince God's people that the papacy is the dynasty of Antichrist, let alone try to tell them what the Jesuit order is about. But I'm glad you're here, my listeners, and I'm glad you're listening and paying attention, and I hope you be inspired to do your own research. Now, Alexander Pope must have had the Jesuits in mind when he penned his cryptic lines, quote, Then rose the seed of chaos and of night to blot out order and, and, and extinguish light, unquote. Indeed, we could sum them up with a famous line from Shakespeare's Othello, Chaos has come again. 
Now we'll begin chapter 9 of this book. We're going to talk about St. Ignatius Loyola himself. Yes, a saint. He was canonized by the Roman Catholic Church, this diabolical, demon-possessed warrior for the Pope. Here's a quote from Pope Alexander. It says, Then rose the seed of chaos and of night to blot out order and extinguish light. Uh, unquote. That was from Alexander Pope. Now, it says, Forgive me, kind reader, but I must say a few more words about the father of the Jesuits. An immense halo has been placed upon the head of Ignatius Loyola, and we must now see whether it is, uh, in fact, rightly deserved. Thus far we have spoken a great deal about the characteristics and virtues of the Jesuits, but what of their founder? Who was this Spartan, this ragamuffin, this fox, El Zorro, this mortal wretch called Ignatius of Loyola? Says J. Huber, professor of Catholic theology, quote, A mixture of piety and diplomacy, asceticism and worldly wisdom, mysticism and cold calculation, as was Loyola's character, so is the trademark of his order, unquote. That is to say, intransigent, intransigent, stubborn, abjurate, intrepid, unscrupulous, crafty, insinuating, perverse, contumacious, lewd, shameless, deceptive, psychophantic, and reprobate. Don Inigo de Lope, de Ones, <laughs> it's a long name. Don Inigo de Ones de Loyola, sometimes erroneously titled Inigo Lopez de Ricalde Loyola, was born in his father's castle of Loyola, northern Spain, close to Especia in the Basque province of Gipuzkoa. The birth of Inigo was nearly contemporaneous with that of the German monk and reformer, Dr. Martin Luther. And it is there the similarity ends. Had the law of eugenics been known to the midwife of, the, of 1491, or perhaps she could have foreseen the future, she probably would have not permitted such a child to have been born. To quote Alexander Pope for, quote, then rose the seed of chaos and of night to blot out order and extinguish light. Inigo, that is Ignatio, or later called himself Ignatius, was the youngest son of the highest Spanish nobility. His parents were Moranos, that is, Jews converted, uh, Spanish Jews converted to Catholicism. So this author claims that Ignatius Loyola was a Jew converted to Catholicism. And it says, from the start, Loyola had all the advantages of his courtly class. His youth was passed in the splendor and luxury of a Spanish courtier, a lean, battle-scarred swashbuckler with the fanatical energy and daring of an Adolution bull. His temper and passions were legendary. The founder of the Jesuits, their helmsman, Ignatius Loyola, was a vainglorious personality and a sexually incontinent man. The Jesuit John Hungerford Pollen, uh, Pollen reveals that, quote, at an early age he was ordained a cleric, but was afterwards released from his obligations, though when or why is not known. Why was Ignatius Loyola released from his vows? Mr. Hugo Hungerford admits, quote, three writs or lawsuits have been found belonging to a hitherto unknown process held in 1515 against Ignatius and his brother Pedro Lopez. The writs, the lawsuits, say Hungerford, charged Ignatius then 24 years of age, and his brother Pedro with, quote-unquote, enormous, enormous delicits. The probability is now clear that Ignatius was involved in some offense which could not be passed over, unquote. A delicit, a, a delicit is a serious criminal offense of canon law, which includes the sexual abuse of a minor, 
unquote. Yet this crime is nowhere mentioned in the many books about Loyola or in the Catholic Encyclopedia. And I won't go into a reiteration about the cause of uh, sodomy, but considering the diabolical influence of Ignatius Loyola and the fact that he was an idolater in the Roman Catholic Church, it shouldn't be difficult for my regular listeners to understand why he was uh, charged with this delicit. It's a common characteristic of the Roman Catholic priesthood. And uh, Romans chapter 1, if you'll read it and understand it, will explain to you why it's so common among the Roman Catholic priesthood. Now, that a delicit usually involves a sexual crime is seen from a controversial letter, delicit gravi- graviobora, gravioribus, excuse me, it's hard to pronounce, of May 18, 2001, from the current Pope Benedict XVI to all Catholic bishops, directing that confidential details of accusations made against priests for certain serious ecclesiastical crimes including sexual abuse, were not to be revealed on pain of excommunication from the church. See final chapters for details of this letter and the Pope's rationale for its use. Now, we also know that Ignatius was jailed in his adult life for his involvement in a secret uh, sect called the Alumbrados, or the Spanish Illuminati. Now, remember, this is before 1540, before the establishment of the Jesuit order. Ignatius Loyola was arrested and hauled into the Inquisition for being involved in the Spanish Illuminati. Many contend that the Illuminati wasn't established until 1773, or 1776, rather. But it's apparent that the Illuminati goes far, far uh, beyond... uh, It's much older than that. It's just a derivative from the ancient mystery schools. Occultic, uh, idolatrous, uh, rooted in the ancient Babylonian mysteries. Okay, so the the Illuminati, uh, as it's known today, is just... human intelligence. The cult was condemned by an edict of the Grand Inquisition in 1623. The first record of the cult was around 1492 in Spain. A variant spelling, Alambrados, appeared later in 1498. So here we're back in in the 1400s, but it goes far beyond that, too. It says they believed that the human soul could enter into direct communication with the Holy Spirit, and due to this they could have visions and revelations. These mystical qualities would later become major features in Ignatian spirituality. Now, Ignatian spirituality is a term that we all need to become familiar with. It's still practiced today in the Roman Catholic Church. The spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola are introductions into this 
mystical and rather diabolical uh, uh, practice. And uh, it's mind control and, re- and, and turning oneself over to demon possession. The spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola, and this book will deal with that, and we've dealt with it before on the broadcast and other books that we've, that we've read and discussed. And uh, you can you can still buy the the, uh, the uh, spiritual exercises. It's sold by the Roman Catholic Church. I'm sure you can go to eBay and just uh, type in spiritual exercises, and you find all kinds of material on it. Now he's going to talk about change of plans and change of names. He says, Ignatius Loyola was ambitious for high glory as a warrior in the Muslim crusades in the Holy Land, but before he could mark, uh, before he could make his mark in that career, an accident befell him. In 1521, while campaigning for the defense of Navarre against the French, he was struck down at the siege of Pamplona, which incident says Wiley cut short his exploits on the battlefield, where he was struck by a musket ball, wounded dangerously in both legs, and laid senseless on the field, unquote. He was obliged to undergo a long convalescence. Now, he doesn't go into a great deal of uh, detail about that convalescence, but the leg that was damaged had to be rebroken and reset and put in traction, and Ignatius Loyola submitted to all that, and... He requested it because he walked with a limp and his courting days were over unless he were to appear healthy. And so he went to extraordinary pains to have his leg reset twice, I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, and all of it without painkillers. And if you if you study the tortures that Ignatius Loyola went through, it's easy to conceive, especially if you're familiar with some of the CIA mind control, that it fragmented his brain. He became a multiple dis, uh, a multiple personality. And uh, <clears throat> trauma-based mind control, a fragmentation of the mind, and so that's the speculation, and you can research that more yourself to help try to explain this this man called Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. Anyway, henceforth, his enthusiasm, chivalry, and valor in battle were to be utilized in another sphere. The rest of the story is well known. Ignatius Loyola was clearly possessed of indomitable courage and zeal. He once said, quote, if the whole society should come to an end, it would take 15 minutes for me to regain my composure, unquote. Having been spotted and taking under the wings of various talent scouts, Inigo, or Ignatius, was able to put himself through university and was later ordained a Catholic priest. But it was not until his graduation ceremony that he dropped Inigo and assumed the name by which he is is most well-known, Ignatius. Loyola already had many friends in high places. Charles Habsburg, for example, who was also Charles I of Spain and and Emperor Charles V of Rome, all at the same time, which two titles Charles inherited from his Spanish grandfather, Ferdinand, and his other grandfather, Emperor Macmillan. Next to the Pope, Charles V was the most powerful man in Europe who was described by one writer as, quote, the handsomest man in the empire as well as the mightiest prince in the world, unquote. Charles and Loyola became friends when the latter had served the court of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, uh, Queen Isabella, Charles' grandparents. It was by means of such powerful friends that Ignatius Loyola's university education was patronized and his new mission secured. It is said that after a visit to England and then to Germany, Loyola returned to France much better off, even upgrading his lodgings in Paris. So the the implication here is that Ignatius Loyola, when he traveled to England and Germany, gained contributions 
<clears throat> he sold his idea to certain powerful Catholics in England and Germany, and uh, they contributed to his cause financially. And it says the influence and backing he received was such that the Pope himself would eventually issue the famous bull Regimini Militantis, which has already been mentioned, sanctioning the fledgling Jesuit order and making Loyola his first superior general, to which post he held until death closed his career on July 31st, 1556. Today, a silver statue stands atop his tomb. Now, the author doesn't go into, into this, but I want to imply that uh, they use silver rather than bronze because the silver represents the silver key or the temporal power of the Pope, and it was Ignatius Loyola's Jesuit order that restored the temporal power of the Pope all over the world. That's why it's silver statue rather than bronze. We've we'll come to the end of the broadcast today. We'll stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur's Cross the Border. We'll see you tomorrow on Inquisition Update. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years?